Hello and welcome to my world. We're going to head back to the workshop in a minute, but first, a little bit of history. This year was the centenary of Pugatti's first race at Le Mans with Brescia's just a short time after the end of the Great War. My family association with Bugatti's began at almost the same time. In fact, while next year will be the centenary of Brescia's first outing at the French Grand Prix, it will also be the 100th anniversary of my grandfather's first race at Brooklands. It wasn't in a Bugatti, we won't reach that centenary for another six years. He's the riding mechanic in this picture. I'm recording this on November the 11th. And this year is the centenary of the Cenotaph, a place for the nation to grieve. Current Covid restrictions made for an eerie Remembrance Sunday, honouring those who gave their lives to secure the freedoms we used to have. Covid has been called our war. While I'm not sure about that, dealing with running my business and watching the problems other industries are having while the whole world holds its breath gives me more insight into something that I think is rarely appreciated about Bugatti. At the end of the First War, this Italian in a small Alsatian town on the newly French side of the border with Germany shattered Europe all around, picked up the pieces and galvanised a workforce from a people brutalised by four years of mechanised warfare. He began producing beautiful cars that generate such passion today. Bugatti is often spoken of as a talented designer, a natural engineer and an artist, but he must also have been a great captain of industry and he did this when he was 30 years old. I wonder Molshine became a virtual Bugatti principality. So now I run family business, third generation to do so, keeping Bugattis on the road and supplying parts and services around the world. When people come here to the workshops, by far the most asked questions are, can we still get tyres? Where do we get the parts from? And do we have original drawings? The answers are, tyres are available. Thank you, Blockley. We make the parts we can't buy, from other sources and yes we do have original Bugatti drawings to work from thanks to the English Bugatti Club. England is the epicentre of the automotive world. When something is good we adopt it very quickly and I'm sure you've heard from other places today that the English club is the oldest Bugatti club worldwide. At one stage Bugatti even gave the club a car for the use of its members. After the Second World War and as the Bugatti factory began to wind down, eventually to be absorbed by Hispano Suiza as part of their aerospace division, the Bugatti Club looked at ways to safeguard the future use of Bugatti, spurred on by prominent members of the club. Notably, eminent engineer Hugh Conway Sr, president of the Bugatti Owners Club, and the man that wrote the book on Bugatti. Literally. A road trip was organised and Hugh Conway Senior and Ian Preston went and picked up tonnes of parts and hundreds of drawings. Those parts and drawings were brought back to England and they were laid out in a farm in Buckingham, not 10 miles from here, where they were assessed. The spares became part of the Bugatti Owners Club spare scheme, a scheme which was later administered by Henry Posner and later still Peter Candy. This is probably the best resource that Bugatti owners got for finding parts for their car. Because not only do they stock parts they make themselves and some original parts still, but also they work with all of the English manufacturers, certainly, to supply parts to Bugatti owners as they need them. With the drawings secured and the spare scheme in good hands, Hugh then found a group of enthusiastic Bugatti engineers and persuaded them to embark on producing components that would soon not be available. Brilliant Engineering, who closed their doors for good this year, manufactured many of the gears required, but crucially they sorted out the roller bearing crank that was the heart of a Grand Prix Bugatti. Crossweight and Gardner also produced many components. While they now focus on other cars, they still supply a wide cross-section of Bugatti parts, including the alloy wheels. My father, who did his apprenticeship as a pattern maker, sorted out the first reliable factory quality replacement cylinder blocks for 35s in the early 80s. As a company, we still make a lot of parts, including cylinder blocks for all Bugattis other than Type 50s, but our focus is actually on restoration of Bugattis. 
drawings, along with Hugh's personal archive, went on to become the basis for the Bugatti Trust, which we set up. This is a great resource for restorers because it allows us access to the original drawings, which means that we can produce parts which are identical to the original for the cars. It also has many photographs and much archival information which allows us to properly restore cars to their period specification. A wonderful place to go if you're just interested in Bugattis, as it covers so much more than the cars. It also covers Bugatti's works, Bugatti's father's works and his brother's sculptures. So now we're going to head back into the workshop to look at one of the projects that we're doing at the moment. In the 30s, a man wanted to be the fastest in the world, but he didn't want to do it on four wheels. His way of going fast involved him getting wet. Carlo Maurizio Rispoli was a man who loved adventure and speed. A Second World War fighter pilot, he raced on the water from 1931 to 1934. His brother-in-law, a great friend of Ettore Bugatti, persuaded him that he should race with Bugatti engines. These were installed in hulls constructed by the boatmaker Celli from Venice, who also made gondolas. These record boats he called Nignette. In total there were four Nignettes. Three of them were built with the fearsome 5 litre supercharged engine from the Widowmaker Type 54. These boats were all destroyed during the Second World War by Allied bombing, probably the Americans. Niniet 3 survived, but Niniet 3 was very different. Niniet 3 was built for the specific intention of breaking the 1500cc world water speed record. As with other Niniets, the hull was supplied by Celli, while the engine and all of the other hardware was supplied by Bugatti. Shelley's two-step hydroplane hull was of traditional construction, using hardwood ply over hardwood stringers. With marginal buoyancy, which means they can't be launched from a jetty and have to be craned onto the water, hydroplanes rely on the lift generated as they skim across the surface, riding on air bubbles created by the steps in the hull. As this boat was designed to travel in a straight line, it had longitudinal boards strategically placed to hold these bubbles on the step. The rudder was front mounted. It was a boat that was designed to be pointed straight and then open the throttle. The throttle in this case controlled Bugatti's supercharged twin cam from the Type 51A 1500cc racing car. Of the same configuration as the familiar 2.3 engine, the reduction in capacity was achieved by reducing the stroke of the crankshaft from 100mm to 66. It also used a smaller capacity blower. In this form, and running a racing fuel blend, it produced around 100 brake horsepower. Mounted in reverse as compared to a car, it drove forward through a standard Bugatti clutch that engaged the Bugatti-designed 13-degree V gearbox. This turned the drive through 180 degrees to the two-bladed propeller. Steering was by cables and chains in a manner that was as recognisable as derived from the braking system employed on the Grand Prix racing cars. The completed boat looked every inch a record breaker. Initially fitted with bodywork similar to the other vignettes, it was found that the boat was quicker when this was removed. So in this guide, Prince Rispoli set the record for 1500cc power boats on the 1st of November 1933, reaching 93.3 km an hour at Lake Como. He later bested this record at Lake Maggiore with a run of 94.8 km an hour, just 0.1 of a mile an hour shy of the magical mile a minute. After surviving the war, by being stored separately to the other three boats at Celli's boatyard. In the 1950s, Dino Celli attempted to resurrect Nignette as a racing hydroplane using a Lancia Aprilia engine. Initial testing showed that it would not live with the more modern three-point hydroplane designs. At this point, it went into storage until we were given the opportunity to resurrect it as it was in its heyday. Initially, we expected to run the boat this year, but unfortunately Covid put pay to this and the plan now is to run it early next year. As the designated crash test dummy, it looks like Count Raspoli. I'm going to get my feet wet. So that's it from a little piece of England that is forever Bugatti. Au revoir. Vive le Marc.